Meetings, meetings, meetings. It's what we do in leadership in the church, right? We go to meetings. Some are great, some, well, not so great. But meetings are such a part of our uh, leadership experience in the church that we felt it important as leading saints to put together the Meetings with Saints virtual summit. And if those of you that have attended other virtual summits, you know how these work. We've gathered about 20 experts or individuals who have a unique perspective about how to effectively run a meeting. And we've interviewed him and we've uh, made that content all part of this virtual summit, which you can watch anywhere in the world. It's free to attend. It starts March 17th and you just got to register. And we're going to cover things like how to make a meeting a revelatory experience, how to create and use an effective meeting agenda, how to hold an effective ministering interview, how to engage all participants in a meeting, even introverts like myself, how to use software applications to streamline your meeting discussions and to really shorten those meetings that to a realistic length and uh, we're going to cover as many types of meetings even sacrament meetings there's going to be covered in this virtual summit so the meetings with saints virtual summit starts may 10th you don't want to miss this phenomenal content just text the word lead to 474747 to find more information or you can go to leadingsaints.org slash meetings again text the word lead to 474747 and register for the meetings with saints virtual summit Okay, everyone, let's take a moment, just take a deep breath. Like, seriously, I know you're driving your car, mowing your lawn or something, but let's just take a breath. (sighs) All right. Just feel the silence for a minute. Feels good, huh? Yeah, we're just going to be in this episode. We're just going to be as we listen to this. Okay. Now, you're probably wondering, why is Kurt starting off this episode so weird? Well, because it's the focus of our episode. And I'll get to that in a minute. But I want to just let you know that my name is Kurt Frankham. I'm the host of Leading Saints, of the Leading Saints podcast. And uh, we strive to help Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. And we do that through various resources like this, the podcast, and also the website at leadingsaints.org. And I'll also make sure that you are subscribed to the newsletter. You can go to leadingsaints.org slash subscribe. And you can uh, you can be part of the newsletter as well, which comes out every week, where we talk about unique leadership perspectives and keep you up to date with all the content that's that we release through Leading Saints. So that's a good one stop shop for making sure that you're up to date with all the content that's coming out with Leading Saints. All right, another deep breath. Yeah, let's just be. We're just here. Okay, I'm being kind of silly, but the reason I'm doing this is this episode is about stillness about mindfulness. And I had the awesome privilege of welcoming four dynamic authors into my home studio here. Carrie Scarda, who is actually the daughter of Wendy Ulrich, who we've had on the episode many times. So Carrie came and was part of this interview. Jacob Hess as well. Kyle Anderson, who actually joined us remotely from South Carolina. And Ty Mansfield, who is also in studio. They are the co-authors of a book called The Power of Stillness, Mindful Living for Latter-day Saints. And this is definitely a must-read for you in the next six months, I'd say. Or if you can do it sooner, it should be your next book. It is such a profound book that helped me just so much as a person, as a Latter-day Saint, as a disciple of Christ, better connect with the divine. And uh, I know you kind of hear like mindfulness, meditation, it all sounds woo-woo, but give this episode a chance. I think you'll really appreciate it. And we talk about stillness and mindfulness in the context of being a leader. How can we introduce that into our wards, especially if we're a bishop or a least side president or an individual who's meeting with people going through a difficult time or seeking repentance? What is mindfulness and stillness? What role does that play? Now, a lot of these concepts feel a bit nuanced, and so it may be hard to really apply some of these things they're talking about, but just, just absorb it. Just be with this episode and consider the concepts talked about and maybe come back and revisit it. But definitely go check out the book and consider these principles of how they might expand your gospel experience, your experience with Christ, your experience with your heavenly father, your experience with the atonement of Jesus Christ. I think it's so valuable. So you're going to enjoy this episode, hopefully as much as I did. But here's my interview with Carrie Skerda, Jacob Hess, Kyle Anderson, and Ty Mansfield, the authors of The Power of Stillness, Mindful Living for Latter-day Saints. Today, I have in my home studio three, sort of four, fantastic authors who uh, co-wrote the, author, the the book, The Power of Stillness, 
Mindful Living for Latter-day Saints. And those authors are Carrie Scarda. Is that how you say your name, Carrie? That's right. Ah, oh, nailed it. All right. Uh, Jacob Hess and Ty Mansfield. And then Kyle Anderson. Uh, Kyle, where are you calling in from? Clemson, uh, South Carolina. Beautiful. And you just got snow there in uh, February morning. That's right. Oh, boy. All right. Cool. So, and feel free as we go through this, you know, just jump in whenever we want to make room and time. Sometimes with a panel, we, we step on each other, but that's all right. So who wants to say, where, where did the, the impetus of this project begin? Jacob, everybody's looking at you. <laughs> I don't even remember now. <laughs> you were meditating one day and... I was exposed to mindfulness in graduate school as a way to help people with depression. And I was struck at how calm the people who meditated were. It was freaky calm. Yeah. I was like, what? And they had bumper stickers that said, what would Buddha do? And it seemed on the face to be a Buddhist thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels that way. I mean, on surface. Like, well, if you want to get into this, you have to go out and kind of get into another tradition. But after being exposed to it, I would come back to my own faith tradition and say, no, wait a minute. You know, we have a lot of excuses to stop mm -hmm. and not do things. Why are we talking about the gospel like there's a lot of things to do? Yeah. And so like slowly it started to seep into how I read the scriptures and how I interpreted things. And I started to see things I hadn't seen before because I had been exposed and trained as a meditation teacher. And then I met Kyle because Kyle was blogging about it and Carrie because Carrie was doing retreats on it and Ty because Ty was in training. We just kind of all brought together. The same angel appeared at all of our bedsides and said, <laughs> write this yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, and, and I guess I need to highlight some of your background. I mean, not just for people who like to write about meditation. I mean, there's some, there's some education in your background. So, so Jacob, what's your background as far as professionally and with your education? Got my PhD in clinical community psychology with a focus on kind of a mindfulness-based approach to depression. Yeah. And uh, Carrie? I am a clinical psychologist as well. I'm practicing. I have a private practice and I've definitely <clears throat> brought mindfulness and meditation approaches into the clinical work that I do with individuals and couples and families. Nice. And Ty? So my education, my master's, my doctorate are in, in marriage and family therapy. My undergraduate was in Chinese studies. I never thought I'd come back to that once I <laughs> left it, but it was in my master's program, again, through kind of the mental health lens that I was first exposed. You know, it's hard to not experience it. You know, when my world is Mormon, there's Latter-day Saint, it's hard to not, you know, see and experience everything through that lens. And I had some very specific spiritual experiences that I feel like were guiding me in that direction. Cool. And, and Ty, you've been on the podcast before, actually, right? With uh, your work with North Star and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and you're presenting this year at uh, North Star on this topic. Is that right? The, the conference? The three of us. Oh, the three of you. Oh, cool. So I'll see yeah. you again there. Good. Uh, Kyle, what about you? What's your background? Well, I'm... Uh... A PhD, a professor of Chinese and Asian studies, and currently an administrator in global partnerships and engagement, those sorts of things at Clemson University. So I actually come to this mindfulness and meditation actually through some textual traditions and philosophy through my um, Asian studies and literature. Nice. So when we, when we talk about stillness and mindfulness, I mean, what... How would you define that to a Latter Day Saint? Because we, you know, we use uh, terms like uh, you know pondering, prayer, these types of things. So, and so, I would imagine most Latter Day Saints, when they hear this, they think, uh, yeah, you know, they think back to Buddha or something. So, how do you even begin to introduce this topic to a Latter Day Saint audience? I actually like Ty's definition of mindfulness the okay. best. All right, you give me you, you do the definition. We'll we'll okay, you're gonna have to add take it over. What here. is my definition? <laughs> compassionate presence. <laughs> oh, compassionate presence. Yeah, I like that. I really like that. So I think one of the I think one of the one of the difficulties with this is that you have different traditions that all kind of intersect. So a lot of times, even and we've had some of this conversation together. Like you know, the power of stillness isn't about trying to get everyone to meditate, right? We think about this as like yeah. you know meditation, but mindfulness really is. You know, I've used the terms compassionate presence. Um, you know, uh, Jacob in the book, he, you know, he was, I don't remember who you were quoting, but, you know, compassionate affection and awareness of the moment, right? Or presence in the moment. So there's, and John, you know, there's a number of different definitions, but you can, whatever you're doing, you can do it mindfully. You know, it, it's not just like, you know, sitting in a lotus position, humming, yeah. you know, mantras, right? <laughs> and I think that's where it becomes especially accessible because, you know, to Latter-day Saints, because 
you know, some people are going to struggle to even want to carve out time to just sit in stillness. But if we're talking about being with each other, with greater pre- with greater presence, less distraction, parenting more mindfully, I mean, any you know rituals that we talk about in the in the book, being really present with the sacrament as opposed to you know texting or distracted usually with us, it's trying to get kids stopping kids from biting yeah. the, the neighbor kids, but. <laughs> But there's, but there's a sense of like all of it can be. So you have, so you have these sort of Eastern traditions and really the, the terminology of mindfulness tends to come from the East. But you have this very rich Christian contemplative tradition that isn't borrowing from the East. They're like, you know, reclaiming and retaining, you know, this early Christian tradition of meditation that has been lost in several strands of Christian thought. And so a lot of our work and our thinking has been at the sort of the intersection of all of these different ways of thinking about mindfulness, meditation, contemplative thought, contemplative practice, pondering, prayer, you know, and where that those things intersect with daily life, but also, you know, more specific religious practices that we can do. Yeah. What would you add to that, Carrie? Amen, first of all. And secondly, I think when we look at Christ's life, we actually see a lot of examples of him being very present in the moment and very meditative and present with how he approaches his, the people that he's working with. Um, One of my favorite stories of Christ being present is the story where he's on his way to heal a child and the crowds are pressing around him. There's a lot of urgency about getting to that future moment of healing that child. And the woman touches the hem of his garment and he's so present in his body that even in the midst of being directed towards the future to this future thing. He's so present that he pauses and is able to have this very intimate healing moment with her. And to me, that is a, the epitome of mindfulness, that we can be so present in our bodies that even in the rush of pressing demands, we can have space to really have healing moments with each other. Yeah. And, and touching on something that Ty said, I mean, this isn't about necessarily like one more thing to do, right? It's not about now we you know, not only should you read your scriptures and go to the temple and do these things, but you should also meditate for, you know, this amount of time each day, but it's more of just being present, right? And of whatever it is you're doing, whatever action or purpose that has, just be present and and mindful about that, right? And present in a particular way, right? It's kind of the, as we talk about in the book, the word busy, the character for busy in Chinese means the death or loss of heart or heart killer. And the, the character for mindfulness is to bring the heart into the present, mm-hmm. right? And so anything that we're doing is we're bring is we're doing it more compassionately with greater awareness, more heart, more tenderness, all those things. That's really the essence of it. Yeah. Uh, the, the word mindfulness is a buzzword now, kind yeah. of like everybody right. uses it. And so some people hear it like, it's like the word empowerment. It means everything like to some people, but so it's not the same as meditation. It's bigger. It's not just a skill. It's more of a way of being. And it helps me to also define the opposite of mindfulness. Like the opposite of mindfulness would be when your body and your mind are in a different place. You lie down at night and you're exhausted and your head is like ruminating about uh-huh. work the next day. Or you're talking to somebody at church. Carrie uses this example in the book and you're like having a conversation apparently, but your head is, is somewhere else. And so mindfulness is about synchronizing the body and mind so that you're in the same place at the same time. And for a theology, it says being alive means to have your body and your spirit and you're in one place. You know, you can think of mindfulness as a way to help us be more alive, experience the richness of our moments here. Yeah. Not, not in two places at the same time. Yeah. Kyle? Uh, yeah, Kyle, we, we don't want to leave you out here. Any, any thoughts? That, uh, that's mentioned? good. I, that has been my understanding and my experience too. What, what I often am trying to do especially because I can't always be with my friends, my mindfulness friends out in Utah, is that I, when I'm, when I'm talking about this to members of the church in particular, I try to think of words that might already be in our tradition that aren't quite as salient, salient, but are still understood. And so when I think of concepts such as reverence, right? Reverence somehow is at a cross section with mindfulness, peace, stillness, the peace, you know, the peace I, I leave unto you, right? The peace, reverence and meditation. We actually use that term pondering. All these things are at cross section of what we're talking about. So as you said, Kurt, we're not adding extra things to do, but we firmly believe we're not really adding new concepts either. We're just adding a new kind of attention perhaps, or raising attention to the things where we already prize and value in our tradition. 
Yeah, that's definitely been my experience that whenever it feels like you discover a new truth, you realize that that truth was always always there. It was always in the Bible or in the Book of Mormon or in the gospel, but now it's sort of to the su- surface. You've brought it and highlighted it, right? Mm-hmm. That's correct. So what would you say to a bishop? I mean, I, I, or, or a busy leader. I remember being a bishop, you know, on a busy Sunday. I'm there, it seems like a, you know, 10, 12 hours, some, some Sundays, and I'm just going from one thing to the next, you know, and, and I'm just taking in information, I'm processing. So obviously it wouldn't hurt for that bishop to maybe take 10 minutes or, or whatever to just maybe be still in that, that office or, or really leverage the time of the sacrament. But even during the sacrament, you're thinking, okay, is, you know, is everybody getting the sacrament? You know, is it going well? So how would you coach or what advice would you give to a busy bishop or relief study president who's just so overwhelmed on a typical Sunday? A good bishop is trying to be like the Savior and minister to his flock. And one of the things that hit us really hard in writing the book was how often Jesus stops and gets away. Mm-hmm. Like when we, when we think, what would Jesus do? We don't think, well, he would pause and, and contemplate. But nine different times in the New Testament, including right after John the Baptist died, he stops, he gets away, he retreats. He has a practice of punctuating his doing with non-doing. So not only are we not adding something to do, we're, we're making the case that the gospel lifestyle itself could become a rhythm between action and pausing, action and pausing. And we have a lot of excuses to do it. We don't even have to, you know, people I teach in my meditation class, they have to be, where am I going to find time to stop? You know, how am I going to fit this in my schedule? For the Latter-day Saints, we already have it built in. It's called prayer, personal prayer, (laughs) scripture study, family scripture study, family home evening, (laughs) Sabbath, date night, temple. Rather than these things all being things to get done, what if they were excuses to pause? Yeah. And stop. I love that. And breathe and be in our bodies and be with people we love. Like, that's not how I have thought about the gospel all often. When I do, it's a whole lot more rejuvenating. Yeah. And I love these terms that we, you know, we already have this built in, but sometimes we just, we sort of corrupt those moments with more doing, right? Like, what my ideal scripture study looks is I, you know, I have four books open and I'm, I'm drawing parallels and I'm becoming more like a BYU religion professor. And, <laughs> and, you know, I'm learning what this word means in Hebrew, right? But just realizing, and it's been a, such a remarkable experience that, that the Lord's taken me down during the, over the last 12 months or so, where he's just sort of telling me, you know, when you do your prayer and your, your scripture study, just stop, just, just be, you know, just be present and don't worry about how many verses you get through, but just say, in this moment, I'm not trying to be a scripture scholar, but I'm trying to connect with the divine. And that's where I want you. That's where I can connect with you, right? Any other thoughts that... Yeah, Kirk, can, can I make a comment on yeah. that too? Yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with what we need personally, right? The, the list that Jacob listed, and we can add a bunch of things to those lists. Mindfulness, we believe, is a way that will help us gain greater access and bring us more in tune with the Holy Spirit. And we all in our tradition believe that that is where we all want to be personally. We want to be so close in connection with the Spirit and Heavenly Father that we know what we're doing next, right? And so for me, when I think of a bishop saying, well, you know, I got all these things to do, or when I read the scriptures, I feel like I should be a scriptorian. I'm going to use myself here, you know, as someone who is an academic the last thing I want my religion to be is look like my work. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Yeah. Like, I don't, want, I, don't, I don't want it to be reading a bunch of books and cross-references. And so what I need, actually, is that scripture study to not be like that. It needs to be more of a quiet communion. So maybe what we're talking about a little bit is that kind of quiet and that peace allows for that individual need that we all have. And maybe a bishop who doesn't, you know, have that the, that kind of intellectual stimulation in the regular life. Maybe that's the, maybe that's what scripture time is for him. Maybe it is for books that are open, right? But maybe in another task that he has, it might not need to be so busy. It's a, it's about that balance, right? Love that. Any other thoughts as far as this leveraging some of these built-in things and sometimes how we we corrupt them with our own traditions or habits? Yeah, if I, I want to, if I could add a piece there, I think. One of the things that Jacob talks about that I that I love and that I think a lot about is he says, you know, he talks about when people, you know, go through faith transitions or struggle with the gospel. 
that often it's not the gospel that people struggle with. It's an impoverished experience with the gospel. Yeah, this is a, a huge the, the point that came out to me in the book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or what they're rejecting is not the gospel. It's an impoverished experience of it. And whether it's, you know, and I've worked with people even a, in a therapeutic context who have been, who have served in high levels of leadership, who have left the church or have experienced faith transitions, you know, and part of, you know, I think with some of them, it there is a loss. There is a, a getting lost in the doing, right? And there is so much to do. And there's always so much to do that, that whether it's a leader or a member, if our experience with the gospel is impoverished, we are going to be more vulnerable, right? And so one thing, obviously, leaders need to stay in a nourished and nourishing experience of the gospel. But if they are mindful, right, if we're attuned to what's going on in our world, in our congregations, and we can see that other people are struggling, or maybe you know when we're really attuned to what's going on, we can you know pick up on that and then and then minister to it, right? And if I could just quote President McKay, because there's a statement from him on meditation that I've always loved and keep coming back to, and he said this: he said we pay too little attention to the value of meditation, a principle of devotion. In our worship, there are two elements: one is spiritual communion arising from our own meditation; the other instruction from others, particularly those who have authority to guide and instruct us. Of the two, the more profitable, introspectively, is the meditation. Meditation is the language of the soul. Hmm. So if he's, if he's saying, of these two things, spending time in solitude and communion with deity, and being, you know, listening to talks, listening to lessons, sitting in talks, sitting in lessons, I would say disproportionately, most members of the church are far outweighed on the side of, you know, just sitting in talks and listening to instruction from others rather than sitting in communion. And I think if there's anything, you know, a shift in our culture that's going to be more valuable, it's seeing that, doing it, right? And obviously, you know, teaching that so that more Latter-day Saints are spending more time in relationship with deity than just in doing religion. Yeah, love that. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, uh, as Ty's talking about that, it reminds me of a time where I was in a ward council and they were talking about how to prepare oneself to be a good minister. And this idea came to this, what we're talking about here was in my mind, this idea of we have to come to the Savior's feet and be nourished by him. And then we are strengthened to be able to go out and nourish, nourish other people. So that idea was in my mind, but I didn't communicate it very clearly. And, and what came across to the bishop in that word council was, oh, yeah, we need to pray first and pray what we can do for our ministering person and then go minister to them. But that wasn't really the idea. It wasn't about let me pray to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. It was more let me sit in this communion prayer for even just a few minutes and feel that connection to my Heavenly Father that then allows me to bring that energy into my ministering. Right. So it's not about another thing on the to-do list. It's really about taking this contemplative time, contemplative time mm -hmm. to sit with the savior and allow him to strengthen us. Yeah. Regardless if even inspiration comes or that exactly. prompting comes, but you're just being in a state where <clears throat> you can better administer to people or better connect with the present state so that you can move forward. Right. Oh, I love it. I want to riff off of what Carrie just said. Kyle, you first. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, and I'll just say that's where the clarity comes. I, I, I'm a big doer. I have a bad habit of doing all the time. And that's one of the reasons why um, I'm devoted to mindfulness. But w we fear that. I always fear that, okay, if I stop, things will get out of control. If I stop, the next thing on the list falls out. But the truth of the matter is there's always an infinite number of things to do, an infinite number of people to see. So what we need is clarity. What we need is clarity and priority and those moments of silence, the subtraction from the activity going away as Christ did or as Joseph did in his life. Going away is where we gain that clarity as a leader to then with great confidence, bolstered by the Spirit, to go do that thing that we know is needful. Beautiful. And to clarify, this is not about sitting around and not getting stuff done. Right, right. <laughs> like mindfulness folks get a lot done. Yeah. But when you do things from that place of calm and resourcefulness, there more, there's more power to them. So what I would add is I notice in my own life, when I get really engrossed in my schedule, 
I notice my attention is sort of centered on the calendar or David Brooks talks about like always being on the clock, you know? So my attention is actually centered on my calendar, not on the, the inspiration in the moment. And so a litmus test for me is, am I interruptible? Mm-hmm. Like it, it, what, can somebody run into me at work or can my child come knock on my office door at home and interrupt me or is something else kind of like, am I driven by something else? And I've, I've decided that for me, one, one way that helps me do this is rather than I've got a hundred things to do today. I like to, in the morning in communion, push back on all the stuff and, and, and really sit with the reality. There's only one thing I need to do today. There's only one thing on my calendar and that's whatever God wants me to do. And and there's a lot of parts and pieces to that. Yeah. But then it it simplifies things and there's less madness in my head. (laughs) You know, it's like, I can do this. I don't have 80 things to do. I've got one thing to do. And my task is to kind of moment by moment kind of suss that out. And the calendar just helps me find the answer to that question. I'm not obeying this calendar. I'm obeying what, whatever, however the spirit guides are, I'm trying to. That reminds me of a great story of the savior where he's teaching, which he's teaching a, a, a crowd of people in a home and um, which I can think of nothing really more important than listening to the savior teach. And, um, but he, he is more focused on, on following the spirit and he is interruptible. All of a sudden the roof comes off and they're lowering a man in the middle of his teaching to be healed. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Christ doesn't say, Hey, I have this sermon prepared. I'm teaching you like, there's nothing more important than that. Off your smartphone. You exactly. You know? <laughs> right. I mean, he's so again, so present that he can pivot and um, turn to what is unfolding in the moment. He's not trapped in his calendar agenda yeah. um, and, and, and work with what is unfolding in the moment. And I love that example of the savior too. Okay. So with this concept of, am I interruptible? You're, you're sa- you're stating, am I, am I present with the task at hand and focused to some level, but am I still open for God to step in and direct me? Is that the, the yeah, idea? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, others may say, well, yeah, I'm interruptible. And that's what's driving me crazy. My phone's going <laughs> off and this coworker keeps coming in. Cause so it's sort of that balance of, am I interruptible to the right things? Is that yeah. Right? Where is your heart? Yeah. Is your heart on getting your checklist done or on what is most expedient and needful and yeah. And I I really like what Jacob alluded to earlier, although it was in passing, this idea of rhythms of stillness and engagement, Mm. and that there are times where we are busily and anxiously engaged in the work, but we can't, if we don't balance that with these rhythms of moments of stillness, which might look like a bishop sitting for literally 60 seconds (laughs) before he brings the next person into his office, if we don't balance that with these little moments of stillness, then we we become unfocused on the spirit. Yeah. We often uh, reference, you know, shower revelation that, that I got this prompting in the shower and we think, why does this always have in the shower? What is it about this, this, these tiles that make it more conducive to revelation? But in reality, it's the only moment in our day where we've, we've cut ourselves off and we're still for a moment. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I like how Carrie keeps pointing back to the savior, but time with Abba was one of the most important things to mm. Jesus. We sometimes say like, well, he was the son of God. That's why he was so powerful. But we reference a, a, a great writer who points out in, in the book that some of Jesus's power, we, we might also understand connected to his willingness to build in this time. And I, I have a temptation to think of my morning worship, um, scriptures, prayers, kind of a, uh, a different from all this other work I need to do. But I, again, it has been helpful to say, this is the foundation for all the work. It's the engine. Like if, if I'm not grounded in what, in my heart and mind with God, I could go and do a bunch of stuff today, but who knows whether it's really in alignment with God at all or connected to his power. Yeah. You know, Anything else that, that before uh, I move another on little topic, tip right? that comes to mind as you're talking about leaders who are in that crunch of busyness with on a Sunday, for example, is meditators will focus on, you know, 
a candle or the sound ohm or something like that. But I think we can meditate on the person in front of us, meaning we're bringing our full attention mm -hmm. to that person who's sitting in front of us without thinking about the next thing that's coming or what happened this morning, but really bringing our full attention to the person in front of us. And that's something that has been helpful to me is in, even in those small conversations at church to really bring my full attention to that conversation, to that person in front of me. And there is something calming about approaching each of those people that way. You don't feel as rushed. You feel that feeling of being present is a grounding in and of itself. Yeah. I love that because Again, you're not saying that, okay, as if, if a bishop is busy and he has all these appointments, he needs to take five minutes between every appointment and, and meditate. But what you're saying is, is when that person walks in, you are 100% present yeah. with that individual. And that right. can be your meditation. Right. I am meditating on presence with this person in this moment. Yeah. Love that. And even I think of like in sacrament meeting, right? Like there, I hear from a lot of leaders who are th always ask themselves, how do we get rid of smartphones? Like we got to. Got to, you know, if we even make announcements, please, you know, silence your phones and put them away, focus on the savior, whatever. And, and of course, you know, do what you want. I don't know if, I don't know how effective that is, but, but being the type of person, whether you're a leader or not, that when you're in sacrament meeting, you're present. And if somehow through your phone that helps you be more present, maybe you're reading a scripture and over, over great. But the focus of being present in Sunday school, in sacrament meeting, in, in all that we do, right? That's, that's mindfulness. That's meditation. Right? Absolutely. Cool. Anything else before we move on to my next question here? Yeah, one piece, if I could just add, kind of coming back to some of Carrie's comments on ministry, there's a, a Catholic theologian, Henry Nowen, who I really like, and he wrote a piece called Moving from Solitude to Community to Ministry. And he was drawing on this episode in the life of the Savior where, you know, he's talking about the way, the order, not just what the Savior did, but the order in which he did it. You know, he went up into the mount and he communed with God in solitude, communed with Abba. And then he came down and surrounded himself in community, and then they went out into ministry. Hmm. And he said the order, there's lots of reasons that that order is important, but one, our, our core, our core strength, our core motivations have to be God. And if they're not, then there's going to be something disordered about everything that flows out from that. So if I am looking, so if I go to community first, and I'm looking from community for that which only God can give me, I'm going to be vulnerable to some kind of unhealthy or toxic relationships hmm. or just unhealthy expectations, right? I'm disappointed that my spouse can't be everything for me, you know, that God can be, or that the word can't do everything or be everything. And so this idea of solitude first, and then everything else will flow out from that. And that ministry, really, when we're in a good place, both spiritually and in community, we then go out together and change the world. That, that order is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that that concept because I I know my day to day life. I I have these little uh, these little troll tasks that are just like begging for my attention, right? And and it's so tempting to just jump in and just start, you know, checking some of these box off and and moving forth my day, but. And it's more difficult sometimes to just stop and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to connect first. I'm going to have that solitude first and then I'll come down, you know, and I think of, is it, uh, oh, what's the prophet? I will not come down for I'm doing a good work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and this, this concept of coming down in, in the scriptures is all over. Right. And that is, there's such a powerful principle. I think it's him and I had that, that, that talks about, you know, I'm going to, I'm doing a great work. I'm connecting to solitude and then I'll get to that stuff. Right. It's not about not getting stuff done. You'll get to it, but you have to start in the right place, right? There's this great quote from C.S. Lewis. It's my, I think it's my favorite Christian definition of what we're talking about. He says, the task of a Christian always starts first thing in the morning when you wake up and all the tasks in your day rush at you like wild animals. <laughs> <laughs> and your job is to push them all back. Yeah. So that the quieter, gentler spirit flows into you. And then that, I mean, it's exactly what you're saying, and you articulated it beautifully, Ty. Then that flow takes over everything. We all know what it's like to jump out of the bed, out of bed, and let those wild animals just carry us away. Yeah, like I know that you know how that feels to do a whole day like that. It's yeah. kind of a depleted, scarcity mindset day, right? There and, is not a gentle, soft spirit in those days for right. me. And I would I would imagine if you ask most bishops, they feel like their Sunday. I mean, a lot of I've heard a lot of bishops talk about the knot in their stomach on Saturday night when <laughs> they wake up and those wild animals carry them off, you know, and here they are supposed to have this, you know, 
special experience and deeper connection with God and these things. And, but they're just being carried off by these wild animals. <laughs> and uh, I've had the opportunity to interview Greg McEwen, uh, the author of Essentialism. And he talks about this in question of, of sitting down and asking, you, asking yourself what matters most. And you can't ask that question until you beat off all these these wild animals. So you can get to a place of saying, okay, they're over there now. Now what matters most? And I will approach that animal and handle it, right? That's awesome. I was just going to say uh, what, what you all said, especially what Jacob just got off finishing was uh, pretty solemn. I have, a, I have a little bit of a tech hack that helps me with this. So I'm, I'm tied to my computer like most of us, whether uh, in your job or, or in the church. And my browser has something like 20 tabs open. And the first three on the left are have to do with, you know, morning devotion and morning writing and uh, scripture, things like that. And I read left to right. If you're Chinese or Japanese, you might put those tabs on the right, but they're on the left. So they're, they're there waiting for me before all the wild, other wild animal tabs. <laughs> yeah. You definitely have to build fences for those things, right? Boundaries are so important in our human experience. And uh, that's, that goes along with tasks, not just with people in our life. Right. Going back to, uh, Jacob, what you talked about with, you know, and I guess it goes back to the wild animal concept of, you know, we need to put these to the side first. And it's not about just getting the 80 things done on our checklist. But what about, I mean, when we have audacious goals and we need to get stuff done, you know, that, that that's the part of me that's sort of screaming inside as you say that, like, no, but I, I really need to get 10 things done today. And if I don't get those 10 things done, I'm going to fall behind. And Anything to help us out to just feel more comfortable with this state of mind of, of just having one thing to do, and that is the will of God. My, my answer would be a very simple question, which is, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> yeah. I say that a little facetiously. I mean, really, how we, we, how we organize our lives reflects our corest values, right? Our core values. And when we're organizing ourselves in frenzied, frantic only task oriented ways, then we are sort of missing that bigger purpose of why we're here. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves more specific questions. Why am I organizing my life in a frenzied way? Why am I choosing to approach my time where I'm over budget on what my time out actually is and, and realign ourselves to those really core values? Yeah. I would add that I've realized on many occasions I have brought my big plans to God, taking for granted that this is, he needs to get on board with it. Like, it's so important. I got to get this done. And I've realized that in some cases, I don't know for sure if this is really what he wants. I just think it's a great idea. And it's helped me to understand that in some cases, doing more is being disobedient, <laughs> mm -hmm. to use one of the heavy words, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that if I'm going to follow God's will, it actually involves taking good things, good, better, best, and taking them out back and, and shooting them in the head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad at that. I don't want to kill anything good. Good, anything good, right? But, but sometimes, like, getting off of the board job or, like, saying no to a family dinner or this or that, like, things... I felt more peace in, in cutting back. It's, yeah. it's been helpful. Yeah, it takes me to the uh, quote I often share from President Hinckley that he, he said that unnecessary sacrifice is evil. And he, I mean, he used a term <laughs> as strong as evil, you know? And because we, we get caught up in this in the church of unnecessary sacrifice, right? That not only do we need to hold uh, or put together a Christmas party, but this needs to be off the hook. Like we need, <laughs> we need to be decorated to the, to the T's and, you know, and it has to be something more. And, or our uh, priest or leader may come to us with a calling and we feel like, well, I'm, I'm supposed to say yes, but it, we have to get in the state of mind of saying, where, how can this overburden me to be unnecessary sacrifice that I'm yeah, missing yeah. this, this mindfulness that's really going to propel me forward. I actually have a, a new, year's, new year's resolution to be less efficient in my mm. life. Oh, wow. Because I, like, I, I've noticed like getting a lot of things done does something for me, that, like almost an addictive quality. Like I feel like a good person. Yeah, it's like, valid. Getting more done, getting it faster. And I don't want to live that way. I get excited thinking maybe I can do more of what God really wants me to do, not just what's in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. There can be a prideful element to it, right? Like mm -hmm. nobody else could do this as well as I can. Nobody could throw that party as well as I can. Instead of recognizing that 
I can do my little piece and that there are lots of people who can contribute little pieces to the world. And I don't have to do all of it. And I'm not being asked to do all of it. I'm being asked to do the one little piece that the Lord wants me to do Yeah, and not feel like so proud of my own self that I can have that I must do all of it because nobody else could do it as well as I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I love this concept. Uh, I'll let you go next, Kyle, but I just want to mention like just this concept of, of I'm going to be 20% less efficient today. And what that mm-hmm. does is it creates space, right? It, it slows things down. And then you maybe get that one thing done and it's lunchtime and you think, huh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but so maybe I'll take a walk or maybe... Maybe I'll, I'll just do something else, right? And that, that goal of less efficiency sounds really un-American. It's like, how could you do that? You're sort of insulting me here. But, but, the, <laughs> but, but I want to say, like, what makes it better is the things you do, your obsession becomes not getting it all done. It's getting what God wants for you done with his power. So the things you end up doing are much more powerful, right? Yeah. I, one of my favorite past uh, teachers, he's actually an evangelical teacher. He gets up in, in front of his congregation. And he says, look, I could give you a sermon today. I know I could. I could put some words. I don't want to do that. He said, I'm obsessed with trying to figure out is God's power behind me in what I'm telling you. That's my obsession. He said, I could just put words on a paper. I could entertain you here. I don't want to do that. My obsession is, am I doing and saying what God wants? Do I have his power? That's what I want my obsession to be instead of getting it all done. Yeah. You know, this brings me to another story of the Savior that he goes in the middle of the night, he goes to meditate on his own. And the next morning, the disciples are looking for him because people have gathered to have him heal them. To do stuff, right? To do (laughs) stuff, right? And these are, people are gathering to have Christ heal them. That's a good thing. And the disciples go and look for the Savior and they're like, why are you here? The people are all down here waiting for you. These are righteous disciples who want to do good things. And the Savior says, we're not going there today. We're going somewhere else. Hmm. And that's interesting to me that the Savior didn't heal everyone, that he didn't preach every sermon, that he did focus first, like Ty and Jacob have said, on what does, what does Heavenly Father have for me today? And then he did at times say no to good righteous requests hmm. in order to follow what what. Heavenly Father had for him that day. Yeah. One thing that Greg McEwen taught me that we often, you know, in the evangelical community, the, the what would Jesus do phrase is, is very popular. And we sometimes obsess about this. What would Jesus do? And Greg said, you know, I think the most, the more important question is, is what would Jesus, what did Jesus not do? Mm-hmm. And, and to sit with that for a while, because there's a lot of things he did not do. There were still people to heal for Peter right. when the Christ had, had, had uh, resurrected, right? So, Kyle, we, uh, I didn't want to miss you. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, th- thank you. No, I just, you know, I want to recognize and bring respect and uh, to the fact that, you know, sometimes Noah does have to build an ark and Nephi does have to build a ship. You yeah. have these big things that are pressing and you need to do them. And I think all of us, to, uh, all of us here, uh, a lot of people that come to mindfulness and meditation, at least from the Western tradition, you're sort of repentant doers, right? You found that something was wrong about, about being so doing engaged or oriented. And so I, I just, I, I want to recognize the fact that yes, we do have to do these things, but we're not asked to do them all the time. Yeah. And I think for myself and my own experience, right? Yeah, God might, might have asked you to build the ship. And Jacob had mentioned sometimes there, there can be an addictive quality to doing the danger I think can come when we associate our own self-worth and our relationship to God being confined or restricted to the accomplishment of great arcs and ships, mm-hmm. right? because then we start pushing ourselves into zones where perhaps he's not there waiting for us, or we can't hear him, or we lose, lose touch with our family and friends and community because we're push, push, pushing. And we've associated our worth or our relationship with God with this incessant doing. And so I, I, that, that is all to say, I, I recognize that sometimes we do have to build those arcs, but then we, we're not asked to do that all the time and we shouldn't be seeking to do that all the time. So. Yeah, if I could, amen and amen. If I could piggyback off of what um, Kyle just said, it's not about not doing, it's about balance. In the sense that, you know, I think in our kind of hyper individualistic Western task oriented, busy culture, we've lost something. And in the spirit of, of Joseph Smith and, you know, this idea that, you know, all truth is Mormon, 
Right. And if I'm not embracing every truth, I won't come out a true Mormon. And there's this sentiment that we talk about in the book of, you know, Brigham Young saying, you know, go out into the world and gather every truth that you can find and bring it home to Zion. And I've, I've loved recently President Nelson, this idea of the unfinished restoration, right? That we're just, we're, this restoration is, is ongoing. And I firmly, I, be, I have believed this for a long time that the restoration won't be complete until we remarry the East and the West, mm-hmm. right? We remarry doing and being, right? Mm-hmm. Because doing, uh, you know, to, to cause comment, there are times when we have to do, there are things that need to be done, but there are means to ends. Right. And they we're still clear about what the ends are the end is all God still. Right. But they're also, you know, keeping together these times of needing to do and times of just being and being, you know, kind of living fully kind of on even just kind of honoring who we are and living out our true identities. Right. As children of God. And we get kind of lost. Richard Rohr, who's a prominent Christian contemplative writer. He said that so often we get so tied to our false selves, you know, and, and it's kind of like rearranging, you know, decks on the or chairs on the deck chairs on the Titanic, right? The whole ship is going down and yet we're trying to figure out which of our false selves, selves is more important, you know? <laughs> and, and so it's really just sort of, you know, remembering and, and Cabot, John Kabat-Zinn, who talked, who talked about this, uh, or who uh, was one of, again, Jacob mentioned his name, one of the kind of the fathers of this introduction into the West. He talks about remembering, right? We think of this as a cognitive exercise, but he's like, remembering is remembering ourselves to something. We're not remembering something. We're remembering ourselves to it. We're reconnecting to it. Hmm. So when we remember God every day, it's every day we are remembering ourselves to God when there are so many things in the world that want to dismember us from God. Right? Hmm. And so living in this space of remembering isn't again it's not cognitive it's all spirit and it's soul and it's being as much as it's doing all of the time and if we it's that spirit that spiritual cancer that we're talking about here isn't the doing it's the imbalance of doing to the lack of being yeah mm-hmm. I, I i think ty and kyle are really wise to clarify this because it would be harmful to see what we're proposing as an alternative to be to doing stuff mm-hmm. It's a quality of the doing that we're describing, where the doing comes out of the being. It's, a do, it's the doing mode of mind versus the being mode of mind, where, you know, it's about being in your head and so focused that you can't actually feel what's going on in your body or in the people around you. So there's a way that the doing can still be happening, but have a different quality to it, coming out of the being. Yeah. And I think this launches us into discussion about in, in their chapter, I think it's chapter eight, as far as uh, being, is that what, or uh, what's being as far as sin is concerned? Because the typical scenario is maybe somebody's done something that they need to go talk to the bishop about. And so they come into the bishop and they say, Bishop, I did this thing. And the bishop says, okay, we're going to do this thing called repentance, right? And and we never leave the the doing category into the being. And so and as I, I appreciate that chapter so much because it just sort of talked on him, and you, you guys can articulate this better than, than I can, but as far as just sort of being present with your weakness, with your imperfection, with your sin, and uh, rather than just racing, racing, racing to, you know, get it to push through the, the, the atonement machine and process, and so we can move on and act like that never happened. So where does being in this, as far as repentance and sin, like what can we learn about that, especially from the perspective of a bishop who is constantly dealing with sin, you know, on his desk as, as people are coming in to see him. If I can speak to that, there's lots of things that I'm sure that everyone will have to say, but there's one thought that I don't think we included in the book, but so I work in a therapeutic context, a lot of times with people who are struggling with addiction. And, and in, in the context, I work with a, a lot of BYU students, UU students, young adults who are for, you know, mostly pornography. Yeah. And very often recovery is focused more on sobriety, right? It's mm-hmm. like just, you just don't the do The white that. knuckle, yeah. Mm-hmm. If you would just not do that, everything would be fine. We're not focused on healing. We're just not doing it, not doing the bad thing. And one of the things, uh, President Kimball gave a talk called Jesus the Perfect Leader. Oh, yeah. For uh, speaking to leaders. All right, it's, it's a great talk. He said, Jesus saw sin as wrong, but he was also able to see sin as springing from deep and unmet needs on the part of the sinner. This permitted him to condemn the sin without condemning the individual. 
We show forth our love for others even when we are called upon to correct them. We need to be able to look deeply enough into the lives of others to see the basic causes for their shortcomings. It's profound. If I'm not able to be with someone enough to really feel what's going on, I cannot minister to them. And if I'm just focused on behavior, I I think I have nothing to say to to it. Right? This uh, Henry Nowen that I mentioned, he says. he made a statement on compassion. He said, you know, he says, most people, we all kind of, kind of agree that compassion is a good thing, but we don't fully appreciate how hard compassion is. And the reason compassion is hard is because it requires a disposition to go with people where they are hurting. Hmm. But that's not our response to suffering. Our response to suffering is to flee from it or try to find a quick cure. cure yeah, stitch it up. Yeah. Want to fix it. And unless I can be with people in their pain, I cannot heal them in their pain. He's like, when we learn to just sit with people and be with people, we can bring new life to a dying body. But so often people go in, you know, I'm talking to people who are meeting with church leaders and they don't feel seen. They don't feel heard. They're kind of given this, you know, the, the directive of, well, just don't do that or see how many more days you. Yeah. It's accountability, right? You, you call me every night and I was this bishop for years and years. You call me every night and you tell me if you slipped up. Send me a text with a thumbs up or thumbs down, right? right? These sorts of things. And, and, and that's not to say that accountability isn't important, but if it's, again, if it's not, if you start there, right? Yeah. If it's not stemming from this place of being able to see deeply enough into the lives of others and to be with them in that space, Mm. to be with discomfort. And I can't be with other people's discomfort if I can't be with my own. Mm, that's and, not true. And, and, you know, we, we might want to demonize pornography, but think of all the times if I, if I don't want to feel my sadness, I'd rather go binge on ice cream. So, I mean, in the sense of how, you know, the, the destructive nature of not feeling my feelings, I'd rather binge on Netflix, eat a bowl of ice cream, you know, all the th- other things yeah. that we might do to numb, distract, avoid. If I can't be with my difficult emotions, I cannot be with the difficult feelings of others. And so this is a discipline and a capacity that we have to practice in the way that we relate to ourselves as much as we relate to other people. But it really is sort of at the core of developing a capacity for compassion. And one of the reasons that I love all of this is that so much of it speaks to things we already believe in. Already. I, you talked to a hundred Latter-day Saints. I can't imagine one of them saying like, why would you want to be compassionate? That just seems like <laughs> unnecessary right? and unchristian. And yet it's, it, it often kind of, it, it stays at the level of a good idea. Right. And so much of a lot of these like, you know, contemplative Christian practices, a lot of these Eastern mindfulness based practices, they are about, you know, if you get in these communities, they're always talking about the practice, the practice, the practice. It's all about the practice. That's what we're doing. We're taking these things that we would very much buy into and just deeply already, you know, uh, believe in. And there's a form and a substance to practice those things and to develop this capacity for compassion, to develop a capacity for greater presence, to, to you know, to, to, to practice greater kindness in ways that infuse all of the things that we already know and believe with just more, more substance. So help me with that. Cause I love everything that you said. And I think most leaders are going to, um, <laughs> are going to hear that and they're going to say, okay, I agree with that. But like, what does the application look like when it's Sunday afternoon, two o'clock and I have Jimmy in my office, how do I be with him? You know, how do I not default to the accountability, you know? So how would you coach a, a leader to even begin that process? Cause it's not something you learn overnight, right? It's a process. So where does a leader even begin to know how to be with somebody and, and show compassion and be in compassion? Well, Carrie spoke beautifully about allowing the person and their face to be kind of meditation. Levinas is a Jewish philosopher. He says, truth comes through the face of the other. It's like sitting with it and mm-hmm. really trying, letting the spirit teach you in the moment what to say and how to minister. I'd like to hear what Carrie and Kyle say about that. But what came up for me is it's understandable that we have framed repentance as a step-by-step process. The Behave, five steps? Behavior, Gen- right. Gen- right. I mean, when I went on a mission, there was the commitment pattern. You're right. Said, uh-huh. All right. Well, like, well, doubt, and we're going to ask you this. and ask you platitudes. Me. Yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I don't know if it's platitudes. It's just that this was a way to order and language things that are pretty nuanced. Yeah. And so I, I think we should give ourselves a break a little bit. We, we've organized the gospel in behavioral steps in a lot of ways. And, but we know in our missionary work, we've moved beyond that 
to a place where we're inviting missionaries to be with investigators and sit with investigators and sense their needs. And they don't have to just follow the steps of the discussions. They don't have to follow the steps of a commitment pattern. It's more of a messy process of kind of being with and parenting is the same thing. <laughs> yeah. How many books are like, here are the five things, here are the five steps. And when my wife and I learned mindful parenting, we threw all that out. Oh, not all of it. Right, Some sure, of it's sure. okay. <laughs> but to be, <laughs> because there's not a cookie cutter thing that you always do, depending on the child, depending on the moment, there are different things the moment calls for. So we, Carrie's comment, like letting each be kind of a, a meditation. In my experience of repentance, I found that the healing I sought from my own betrayals ultimately came not from my doing, but from things that God did with me, in me, as I, as I kind of worked to align my heart yeah. and had my own wrestle. And that's grace, right? I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. And, and I started to experience repentance as uh, my, my favorite way to describe the gospel is tomorrow does not have to be the same as today. This can be a new moment. I love the verse in, in Revelation where you see Jesus on the throne and like all things are become new, right? Yeah. He offers a new day for all of us, not just the drunk line in the street. Like we can begin again, moment by moment. Each moment can be a new moment. And I love how Alma says in Alma 37, now is the time when you can turn around. He doesn't say within the next two or three weeks, yeah, or after these five depending steps, on how severe it is, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. now is the time you can turn back. And so in, in the book we talk about, and both of you alluded to this, repentance is a practice of turning back, turning back, turning back. Just like in meditation when we teach our students, mm-hmm. notice when your, your mind has wandered off and bring it back to the breath. Mm-hmm. Notice when it's wandered off, bring it back. It's and crazy how much it does that for me. Notice <laughs> where your when your heart has wandered off to the ice cream again or the schedule or this. Yeah. <laughs> and enjoy it. You know, bring it back. Bring it back to Jesus over and over and over. And and President Nelson's daily repentance talk is beautifully reflective of this. Yeah. Like, it's a daily thing. You just keep and bringing it back again in a particular way, noticing that when the mind wanders, we're not beating ourselves up. Because that happened, yeah. right? Yeah. It's this space of, you know, you know, John Kabat Zinn defined mindfulness as being fully present on purpose in this moment without judgment. And that non judgment piece is really key. Because if I start, if I notice, if I'm trying to be really present with a client and all of a sudden I'm thinking about what I need, you know, where I need to pick up my kids that night, my on purpose is to be fully present with this person in front of me. And so rather than beating up on myself, myself or, you know, my mind wandering, I just gently, compassionately invite it back. And, and that's what repentance is, is, okay, we may have straight, but we gently, compassionately just invite it back to our point of intention. And that's our yes. That's being with God. That's being in a new day, a new moment. Becoming a Christian. And I do think you were saying the bishop at two o'clock with Jimmy, right? Um, <laughs> I do think there are pragmatic resources we can refer people to or help people to get access to. But the bishop's role in that moment is to be a healing relationship. And I do believe that loving, healing, loving relationships can be very healing to some of the underlying issues that Ty is saying lead people into those types, into behaviors that are not healthy for us. Uh, One definition I heard of love a long time ago, which I just really have come back to over and over again, is that love is creating space for the existence of another and I think when, when a bishop can create space by asking curious, non-judgmental questions about what is this like for you? How is this for you? Um, tell me more. Um, that space and that loving space can be very healing, even if no pragmatic solution is offered in that moment. Mm, I love that. And, and just again, realize, because I think it's easy for a bishop to slip into, or any leader, a parent, slip into sort of that uh uh, he did it again. Like how many more times do we got to meet Jimmy? You know, like, let's get this on track, but just saying, you know, we're just bringing it back. Just like mm-hmm. you said, we're just bringing it back. This is, this is the gospel. It's repentance. We just bring it back. And oh, again, all right, we're bringing it back. Mm-hmm. Right. And doing that exercise through asking these questions is saying, tell me more about that, Jimmy. You know, you know, what, and when you're in the moment and you make this mistake, what are you feeling? You know, what's going on? You know, rather than like, well, we need to fix you. Like you're in surgery here. We're doing spiritual brain surgery to, to fix you. Right. So that's good. It's the curiosity. Yeah. Right. I'm curious enough about you 
and care enough about you to want to get into your life. And if I could just share this too, there's a Mennonite uh, minister who said this. He said, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. Mm. And so having someone there who feels like you see them, even if you don't have the answers, it's not about having the answers because so often we don't. It's, you know, caring enough to just to be with you and to, to be curious enough to hear what your story is, what your pain is, and just to excavate in that itself without any answers can be such a healing bomb for someone. Yeah. And it takes me, like you mentioned early on, Ty, as far as this concept of faith transitions, and this is something I hear all, a lot of leaders email me about is, you know, okay, I have four or five people going through a faith crisis, quote unquote, in my ward. And and what do I do? You know, what do I say to him? A lot of times we're like, okay, I need five references on Joseph Smith's polygamy because that, that's what's got him held up. So if I can give him the answer, right, that'll that'll help them. But little do they know, or you know, that maybe what their holdup is, is that their faith experience is not giving them a mindful experience that they hope they would get out of a religious experience. And their only default is to go to these logical questions that have them hung up. And so in this process, as we're working with people, it's sort of just putting the right answers aside and say, wow, like you feel this way. I want to just be with you. And I'm going to be curious about why you feel this way and take out any stigma or shame for feeling this way and just learn and be curious. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and another way to, to visualize or conceptualize this, there's uh, leaders in meditation and other traditions. They talk about, they describe this in meditation as if something comes in to distract you and time Ty alluded to this, you, you don't uh, get angry with yourself or angry or uncomfortable with that. Thich Nhat Hanh said, you, you sort of smile at it, right? And the Dalai Lama is a great example. They sort of laugh at it, right? So we're primed to be repulsed, be horrified, be afraid. And that sends us into reactive mode where we're not really dealing with things compassionately and getting at the root of things. We're running. But if we smile, right? and we embrace, right? Then those sorts of distractions, whether it be inside us or with, if you're a leader, the person across from you who's done that thing again, and you're kind of annoyed now, and they're upset by smiling and understanding this as a, as a manifestation of an, uh, a stage in your development with God, right? It's, it's, it's just these subtle changes to how we react to things, the face we put on things, how we accept them then all of a sudden we're open to the reality which we believe in that we're on a path of eternal progression. We're not trying to shove everyone through the eye of the needle now. <laughs> um, this problem that keeps manifesting, we smile at because God is in the good and the bad and he is there for the eternal hall and we are too. And we're smiling at this and it gives us an opportunity to work on our relationships. One more thing connected to Kyle's comment. We love the stories of someone who was in a really bad place and then experienced this powerful uh, moment with God. And then everything was different after. Mm -hmm. Better. Better. And they were good. It's Ebenezer Scrooge. It's Alma the Younger. It's Paul. We love it for good reason, right? Mm -hmm. What a, we love the resolution. We love it. Yeah. It's beautiful. What happens when it's not like that when there's mm -hmm. when there's relapse when there's a, two good weeks and then a, a struggle when it's, and messy, two, right? when it's messy i think the wisdom kyle's pointing towards is can we be okay with a different looking process as well or is there sort of this residual oh, what is up with you yeah <laughs> and 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 what i loved about president nelson's talk in repentance is it was a powerful comprehensive um endorsement in my mind of that messier approach. <laughs> yeah. It, From a beautiful, loving man saying, kind of, don't we all need a chance to turn back and turn back? It's not that drunk line in the street alone, <laughs> you know, or the person struggling with pornography. It's like the active release society president. It's, it's the anger that can come into us in this country right now for those idiots on the other side. It's all sorts of things. And to make it this kind of daily practice where we're turning back and it is messier and it's not as exciting as the Ebenezer, Alma, Paul yeah. narrative. 
but it gets us to the same place. We might not be visited by angels in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. I often go to like, if we do have, you know, Jimmy who's a teenager who's struggling, like we envision redemption looking like Jimmy gets, you know, gets his act together and he goes on, on a mission. But what if Jimmy doesn't get his act together, but he gets sealed in the temple when he's 35? Are we still okay with that? Because again, it gets us to the same yeah, place, this- but it's messy, right? And so I think as leaders, we... It's sort of that form of meditation. We sort of come back to like, I'm, I'm at peace with that process, no matter how it looks at the end, even if Jimmy misses out on the, the mission opportunity. It's a trajectory. I work with people who struggle with pornography and in many cases it is years of progress. Mm-hmm. We don't like to say that out loud. It's like oh, years, everybody wants like something that's going to just change it dramatically. But the truth is that change for all of us happens in these moments over time and that eternal progression idea that the saints often get beat up for like, Oh, you guys think you have to try so hard. We in the book give as well our witness that that eternal progression idea is beautifully godly. This like constant growth and it's not a constant striving and like dissatisfaction. It's an ongoing unfolding of Mm -hmm. That's why all the talk in my mind about identity and like who, you know, this is who I am and you better accept it feels so dangerous to me. Mm. You better accept who I am, accept who this 14 year old tells us he is. I'm like, what? If somebody told that to my son, I'd, I'd fight them away. Mm-hmm. It's who knows, like some of the meditation mass, uh, teachers that I follow speak about identity with sort of a humility and reverence. Like, well, we're going to find out. Yeah. You're going to find out and you're going to decide who you are over time, moment by moment, as you interact with people. And it's going to be an unfolding becoming. Our faith understands that in a way that we get beat up by other Christians because I think we're too focused on striving, but we don't have to apologize for that. There's beautiful, it's just a beautiful thing to be on this ongoing, lifelong, eternal journey. What about just as far as um, you, having stillness as, I don't know if tool seems like the wrong word, but uh, using it as a resource as we're leaders, you know, as we're meeting with people, we've touched on a little bit in the process of repenting and, and helping people repent. Um, but just in our um, day-to-day interactions with people, anything else come to mind that a leader could keep in mind uh, as far as using stillness in our interactions with those that we lead? I would actually like to, to take it in a little different direction. Yeah, that's right. Because I think, because there's the micro and then there's the macro. Mm -hmm. And we've talked, you know, there's these like micro experiences about how you employ stillness in these very specific kind of moment by moment ways. And I think that leads to, in the mindfulness research, they talk about, they differentiate between what they call trait mindfulness and state. And I I think the, the analogy that I use for that is just like, you know, going to the gym, if you go to the gym once and get a really good burn and you never go back to the gym again, you went to the gym once and you got a really good burn. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the consistency over time that leads to the, the substantive changes in our, our body, right? And in mindfulness, these state experiences with mindfulness as we practice stillness today in this moment right now, the cumulative effect of that over time is where mindfulness becomes who we are. And a lot, and and people who have interacted with um, the name Thich Nhat Hanh has coming up, come up a couple times, and he's a, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk that's just very, very beloved. And and people who have interacted with him have said that you know when you're with him, you can just feel the world slow down, like just being in his presence. He's, he just eludes and emits this kind of uh, this kind of stillness and presence. But I think in all of this, with these capacities with non-judgment, and I think this is where I think a lot of my own journey, where I feel like God was very specific in prompting me, I want you to understand this. I want you to learn this. And it was in the context of of being single and not knowing what marriage was going to look like. You know, and I'm a student at BYU. No, no, I'm not a student at BYU. I, well, I, so I work part-time teach part-time in religious education at BYU. So I work a lot with students who are kind of in this phase of life too, where everything's about marriage and family, getting married, having kids, feeling overwhelmed by, you know, and if I'm not married by 24, you know, I've got a client who's a 19 year old and it feels like she's getting old. Like she's supposed to be married already. Hmm. 
And there's this culture of expectation and narratives around what your life should look like, what you're supposed to be doing. And we get lost in that all the time. What our kids' lives are supposed to look like, when you're supposed to leave on your mission. And if you leave a couple of years later, or if you haven't left at 18 or 19, our anxiety goes up. And so much for me of this practice was learning how to just surrender and let my life look like whatever God needed. And if that meant, because at the time I wasn't getting married, I wasn't married and didn't really see that on the horizon at that point. And that meant that if I didn't get married, I could be okay with that. And I could live a rich, full, meaningful life in God because that's what it's about. It's not about getting married. In heaven. And it's not about having that certain calling. And it's not about all of the things that we're supposed to do or the things that are supposed to happen in, in the broader kind of macro narratives hmm. of our lives. And so to practice this non-judgmental compassion and a surrender of everything else outside of this moment and let, and you know, and life is built up of moments. And I think this was what the Lord was trying to teach the Israelites in the wilderness. Forget tomorrow's path. Hmm. That will come to you tomorrow. If you want Zion, if we're going to prepare you for the promised land, it's by relying on today's manna today. I'm not giving you anything out, anything more than that. Right. And yet we get so far ahead of ourselves. And if God's not going to promise me a spouse by 24, I'm out of here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll find it someplace else. Or, you know, so there's all sorts of things that I think we get stuck in, in terms of expectation. You know, there's a therapeutic mantra that expectations are premeditated resentments and we can live out our lives that way. Right. When God doesn't show up in our lives in the way that we're supposed to. President Packer said it was that, you know, the line and they all lived happily ever after is never written into the second act, right? <laughs> the third act, yeah. right? When all the mysteries are solved and everything is made right, the entire second act is designed in most narratives to be messy. We're still trying to figure out who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and what's right and who's, you know, and so to learn how to be in that, to be in the moment right now when it's messy, when we don't know what our lives are going to look like. And when we don't know if we're going to get married or when we're going to get married or if we're going to have kids or if we're going to lose this kid or what's, you know, if my son or daughter is ever going to, you know, figure this or that thing out. Right. And we get just so lost and stuck in, in how things are supposed to be. And if they're not, we fail. And so this practice is about, you know, one of my favorite teachers, Tara Brock, she just came out with a book called Radical Compassion, where we are really just practicing being in each and every moment in the most honest way, in the most compassionate way, and with others in the same spirit, right? And that's really the substance of the gospel. To, in my mind, that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Right? That's what Christ is calling us to. That's what Zion is. That's the promised land. And there are some real practices here that over time will help us to develop that muscle in a way that it, it's not just something we're practicing today. It's who we are. Wow. And I love that, you know, Jacob talked about these wild, uh, these wild animals that are tasks. And, and I love that you put this in the context of these narratives that we have in the gospel, that those are sometimes another form of these wild animals coming at us. Like if your son does not go on a mission at 18 years old, you messed up as a, as a person. And so this, this practice can put ourselves in a mindfulness of saying, I recognize that as a narrative and as, as a wild animal, and I'm going to keep it at, at, at bay while i just connect with God because that's really why I'm here, not necessarily to fulfill these these uh, arbitrary narratives that surround me. Right. I would like to add one thing about mindfulness and mental health. Mm. I know that this weighs on a lot of bishops and relief study presidents. It's understandable when these mental health problems come up that it can get scary because we know things can unravel and things can get tough. I have seen a tendency among normal folks who aren't professionals to say, Oh, well, I better not. <laughs> yeah. I'm, who am I? I'm, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a professional. And I want to suggest that everything that we've said about the healing power of being with and listening to someone can be really helpful for people with depression and anxiety. This idea that depression and anxiety is not connected to anything people do in their lives is just ridiculous. It's not actually empirically, scientifically true. There's hundreds of different connections between choices people make in their lives and how they feel emotionally. And so the work of ministry in the gospel is, can be directly connected to helping lift burdens 
my father's a mission president right now in New Jersey, and he's he's seen people come and investigate the church with huge burdens of depression and find in the process of repentance and coming in baptism a lifting of a lot of it. That doesn't mean, you know, what it sounds like it could mean, but it does mean that there's sometimes just think it's only a professional thing. And we talk about it like we've got to just do something to make it go away. That can sometimes make it worse. And there are a lot of resources, mindfulness-based resources that can help people with mental health. I'm part of an organization called the Council for Sustainable Healing. And on our website, we've got a lot of free resources for people, depression, anxiety, that they can do in their own home Mm. as an additional supplement and support to whatever professional support they receive. So a little, I hope people can know that your, your impact as a leader can make a big difference there. Yeah. And I appreciate you mentioned that because sometimes as a leader, you can feel like, okay, this person has obviously has some clinical depression, anxiety that we need to get handled. I'm going to refer them to a counselor, which of course is a good idea, yeah. but then there's, you know, there's no space for me here, but in reality, there could be a great practice of that person regularly meeting with a bishop or release really society president and being present with them and encouraging them. And, you know, having a gospel, uh, scriptural, discussion, even if we don't talk about the depression or the problem, right? And just having them create a space there for them to come and connect with the divine in, uh, through the bishop's office or right. with the Relief Society president, right? right? Instead of asking what's wrong with you, let's ask what has happened to you. And a bishop, a Relief Society leader can be a person that hears their story and finds ways to minister to them. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to just share sort of what practicing this has been like just in my life personally going from how Ty was saying, going from a trait to a state, right? I'm still in the process of trying to be a mindful person rather than just you know, do it. (laughs) So I'm still in the process of that, but I've noticed that when my attention is on being more mindful or being more compassionately present, that I'm less reactive, that when I don't understand something or when someone is frustrating me or there's a policy or a doctrine in the church that I just don't get, I'm less reactive to it. I'm more able to just sit with it and be curious about it and be gentle about that rather than having sort of a a knee-jerk reaction to it. I notice that I feel more joy in the little things of life, in those little moments of serving at church or those little moments of connection. They're more colorful somehow because I'm more fully seeing them. And that helps me feel more um, steadiness in my relationship with not just my heavenly father, but with the saints and with the, the church, I feel more steady and I feel more joy in my worship experience. And that's part of why I continue to practice this is because of the personal benefits I feel. in it. Beautiful, Gary. Kyle. That. Yeah. And I would just emphasize that I know that some of the things we've been talking about, they, they seem intuitive to us because we've been practicing it for a while or we've been, you know, reading the literature of late, but I've got to be honest, a lot of my brothers and sisters, literally and figuratively, this feels really strange to them. So to all of a sudden a Bishop to, to accept this as a, as a new method or way of approaching things, it would be hard. I think for a lot, I think we have to recognize it's, it's hard for our brothers and sisters in a Western tradition, in America, in a driven capitalist environment with our own tradition being built on, you know, making a livelihood, building cities for ourselves, civilization, you know, the, the, the whole driving force behind everything we do to try to talk about these parts of the gospel of slowing down. So I just want to recognize that that's hard for a lot of people. We all believe strongly in our own experience that it's a real blessing and helps us live the gospel of Jesus Christ more fully and more uh, sincerely. But I just also wanted to recognize that uh, it could be, it, it's a challenge. The things I think we're, we're, we're asking people to do sometimes just because for cultural, religious, or other reasons, even political, these sorts of things can be associated with sort of yeah, hippy dippy progressivism. <laughs> you know, I, I, if we recognize, I think it's good for us to recognize so that's, it's not as easy for others yeah. to, to accept. That's great. And just having like leaders listening to this or individuals listening to this, 
just have some level of self-compassion saying, you know, this, these are obviously great ideas that you can be excited by this practice, but uh, you're not, you're not going to figure this out, right? It's a process. And so just have compassion with yourself, knowing that uh, every day you're just going to try a little bit more to, to be. <laughs> or, or others, others that you, you want to share it with that you yeah. think will help them. You know, sometimes you, this can be a challenging idea for them to accept. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Carrie, you, you're going to be the spokesperson as far as telling people if they want to know about this book or find it. Obviously, it is Deseret Book Published, right? So again, this isn't a hippy-dippy progressive bookstore that's only <laughs> selling you. this book. <laughs> this is the Deseret Book that published this. And so uh, I assume people can yes, start there. Yes, it can be found at our book is The Power of Still, Mindful Living for Latter-day Saints. And it can be found at Deseret Book. Awesome. Cool. All right. The last question, we'll just do a quick round the robin. As you ponder on your work in this practice of mindfulness, of stillness, how has it made you a better follower of Jesus Christ? Who wants to go first? Kyle, you, you're first since you're so distant. Yeah, for me, it helps me be um, more uh, compassionate and connected to other people. So a lot of what we've been saying, it sounds like we're meditation or mindfulness might be stepping away from others or ourselves. But really what I have found in my personal life is it opens up a constant place of connection to God and others? Uh, I think <clears throat> probably two things. One, I feel like I'm better able to let go and let God. Learning how to surrender, to be in the moment, to be compassionate with myself, to be compassionate with others, to let us all you know, be in process and to be with each other in kinder, more compassionate ways. I feel like I, I can be with myself in, in, in kinder ways. I feel like I can be with others in kinder ways. I can ex It's enabled me to experience a deeper intimacy in all of my relationships with others, with God, too. I feel like my relationship with God is more intimate. But ultimately that I can be here in this mortal sojourn on an errand that is not mine, more connected more able to surrender my own stories and narratives and expectations of what life should be able to surrender to trust in the unknown and letting God be God and letting his ways not be my ways. I think the practice as a whole, I think I've always probably believed those things theologically, but I feel like this practice has enabled me to really surrender into that. And as Carrie was saying, I feel like I'm still on the journey of seeking to be a mindful person. But the practice of mindfulness is an ongoing practice that helps me more substantively live out those things that I believe theologically. Awesome. Check it. This has given me a moral framework to help me see stopping as a good thing, not a bad thing. And in that stopping is where I find God. God finds me. The other thing is that it, mindfulness has helped me learn to rest in my spirit rather than just stay in my head. And it's helped me see my thoughts sometimes as just thoughts, not as reality. So rather than living by every thought that proceeds forth out of my head, understanding like I'm not that's not the work, living by every word that proceeds forth out of God's mouth. And sometimes my thoughts are just random craziness. Gary? <laughs> <laughs> nice. okay. uh, one practical but very profound for me impact of studying and trying to practice this has been the impact on my prayer. That I no longer approach prayer only in as a grocery list of what I want or a recitation of how my day went. Um, I really experience prayer as sitting with my Savior, with my Heavenly Father, and just feeling warmed by their presence. And sometimes that's with words, and sometimes that's really just sitting in stillness with them, as you would with a really good friend where you don't have to say anything at all and know that you're being fully understood. <laughs> so my experience with prayer has been really transformed. And then the revelation that comes out of connecting with God in that way has been really life-changing for me. All right. That concludes my interview with these four fantastic authors of The Power of Stillness, Mindful Living for Latter-day Saints. Am I right? Should we just take a moment again? Deep breath. <sighs> yeah. 
yeah, let's just be right. Like we, we, there's probably maybe a next episode or another podcast on your queue and your podcast app, or maybe you have to turn this off and run a new appointment, but just take a moment and say, you know, after this episode or after this uh, episode concludes, I'm just going to stop my podcasts for a minute. I'm going to stop the noise. I'm just going to be for a minute. I'm going to reflect and wherever I'm headed, I'm going to be 100% present there. And the next meeting I go to, as it relates to my church calling, I'm going to be 100% present with no expectations, with no hopes that uh, you'll be able to be a better person or you'll become something that you're just going to be, right? This episode helped me so much. I hope it helped you as much as it helped me. And uh, I felt so calm after they left my, my recording studio here. It was just like, wow, I've, I had my own personal meditation session, but definitely a book to check out. Again, it's published by Desert Book, so I, I mean, it's not a dangerous book, folks, all right? Uh, and definitely worth a read and definitely something to consider and talk about with your board council, with other leaders, and just reflect. How can you bring more stillness, more mindfulness to your leadership? And then will you share this episode with somebody else uh, that maybe would benefit from maybe slowing down a little bit, being more mindful? And drop this link in a in a uh, email and send it on their way or put it on social media and you'll bless the lives of many others. And don't forget about the Meetings with Saints virtual summit on March 17th. Register for free by texting the word LEAD to 474747. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness, the loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.